Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Bengal Tiger Podcast. I'm Matt Bruni, and joining me once again is Shay Dixon. We are fresh off of, what, uh, 10 hours off the flight at this point from last night? Uh, yes, there were a lot of LSU fans on our flight home. There were. There were. It was a... Uh, not, not, I don't call it somber, but it was a little bit, you know, a little bit more monotone of a flight. Uh, not, not a lot of go tigers and stuff like that because the tigers ended up losing to Georgia fifty to thirty in the SEC championship game. Uh, a game that, I mean, there's there's a lot of ways we can cover this. Uh, just like with every game, it's layered. Um, there's a lot of aspects that we'll get into that I'm sure fans want to talk about, but. If we just start from an overall perspective, I actually thought LSU played at a pretty high level. They end the game with 549 yards, uh, 502 of those being passing yards. Obviously, LSU was up by a significant amount in the second half, so make of that what you will. Um, But offensively, they did enough. They put up 30 points on a great Georgia defense. Defensively, I think I'll get into that a little bit more. I was pretty disappointed. Even though they started the game with a three and out, they end up pretty much giving up touchdowns on a lot of the subsequent drives and end up getting blown out. So where you at, how you feeling? And uh, just what, what was your main takeaway from last night? Oh boy. Um, I think, I guess on the most base level takeaway, the spread was 17 and a half Georgia covers wins by 20. So that's about what you expect. What I didn't expect was that they would combine to score 80 points. So yes. Georgia, I mean, if we're looking at some silver linings here for LSU, Georgia had not allowed more than 22 points in a game all season. LSU drops 30. You know, that was impressive. LSU holds the, what, SEC championship game passing record now with more than 500 yards. Uh, Jaden Daniels goes the whole way in the first half. Nussmeyer in the second half. Um, So, yeah, as a, a team total, over 500 passing yards against Georgia's defense, which is impressive no matter if they were playing from behind or what i think the reality people will say well they were losing they had to throw it well they weren't losing in the beginning and they couldn't run it so they were going to have to throw it all game no matter what the fact that they still were able to throw it and put up 500 on the best defense in the country um makes you feel good and we'll unpack it i know look i'm I'm sure people are tuning in here expecting this to be a quarterback podcast so we'll get some of that in but um we do have well jay look you have Let's let's just get this out of the way. Oh God. Okay. You've been on the Nuss bus in fall camp. Yes. For the folks before who are listening camp. before fall yeah. camp. For the folks who are listening and are members of our site. Um, and even if you're even more of a diehard and you participate in any game threads or listen to all the podcasts, um, Matty B does have his uh Nuss bus driver's license certification. He has been driving it for some time now. That does not mean you didn't like Jaden Daniels. And I think what sums this up in the most easy way to put it is Jaden was the perf- the right quarterback for them to be playing all year. They would not be 9-3 and three going into that game, I don't believe, if Nussmeyer was the quarterback. Jaden protected the football. Jaden's got legs. He made a lot of huge plays with his legs. Um, and he protects the football. He does not turn it over. Uh, you and I were talking last night. Jaden's turnovers this year, his first pick was Tennessee game on the last play of the game when they were already getting blown out, and he's throwing it to the end zone for a touchdown. Mm-hmm. Uh, Arkansas, when the start of the game, he goes to throw it, decides he doesn't want to throw it, and it kind of just slips out of his hand and just goes right into a D lineman's arms. And then last night, bounces off Besh's hands onto his helmet, onto another player's hands, and then gets picked off. So those are your three – interceptions for Jaden this year fumble wise AM backbreaker fumble that one was massive right we get yeah. that but Nussmeyer fumbled it in the second half and threw a pick in the second half so like yeah. just in a half of football I'm not even going to mention the southern game just in a half of football against a good team he's turned it over almost as many times as Daniels had all season so now obviously what people are screaming is but you're right Nuss comes out and wants to throw it downfield he wants to push the ball you and I have talked all year about how they don't have any explosive plays in the Daniels playbook and not that Daniels can't throw it deep, but that's just not what they do when he's in there. It's always a methodical approach. It's let's keep things kind of not simple, but safe in in a way to where you're running the football. It's short passes. Let's get, 
you know, into the red zone and then use Daniel's legs in the running game. Nussmeyer is the polar opposite of that. And it was fun to watch. He was, we were sitting in the press box and we could predict every play. It was, it's almost like Nussmeyer knows exactly what the rhetoric out there is. So when he gets in, he's like, Hey, I'm let's go. I'm throwing this thing all the way down the field. Yeah. The funny part is remember when he said that he didn't want to be labeled as a gunslinger (laughs) before the season, he was like, you know, I don't want to be labeled as a gunslinger and I want to be just someone who gets the ball to playmakers and just moves the chains and all that stuff. All right, Garrett, you, 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 if you say so, um, but no, you're, you're right. I, I think we, we talked about it on the, on the drive back to, to BR. It's like Jaden Daniels was the right pick for, for this, uh, for this team and this offense, I believe like with the way the defense, I think was set up to play and with, Matt, Matt House is the DC. I think the defense is good enough to win you games if you just don't give the other teams the ball. And while I understand, and this is what makes it challenging, is that you have Kayshawn and you have Malik and you have Brian Thomas, you have Jare, you have really good receivers here. And that's why before fall camp even, I went back, it was July 27th, I made a video saying Garrett Nussmeier should be the starter. And I felt like that was just because you have to have a little bit more of a vertical passing game and his potential his ceiling was just higher, but obviously the floor was much lower with Garrett Nussmeyer. Like that was undisputable. And he would have lost you a couple games that maybe, you know, they wouldn't, they didn't lose this year. So it, it's a give and take. Um, like ultimately Jaden Daniels, I believe was, was uh, the right decision. But to me, Garrett Nussmeyer's talent has always been undeniable. And that's what I feel like people just gave up on when they're after the Southern game, after those turnovers, which again, were unex- inexcusable, they just gave up on him, and I didn't think that was right. I want to shout out. We always like to include folks uh, from the the site on the podcast. Um, let's see where he is. Tiger Ryder, um, who actually doesn't have a ton of posts. Um, mm-hmm. Been a member of the site since uh, fall camp. Said, uh, and I posted my post game thoughts, and I actually said, mm-hmm. "Look, the last time we saw Southern, or last time we saw Nussmeier in extended action was Southern." And it was bad. You know, he was trying to gun, be a gunslinger and he was throwing picks and a pick six that was very weird. And just like it just looked ball. bad. I skipped over Tiger Ryder points out and just says, hey, just to mention it, Nuss actually did play really well against New Mexico. I totally forgot that game. Like if you were to say, name all the 12 teams LSU played this year, I would have struggled to remember the New Mexico. Game. That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> so. Nussmeyer, let's see what he said. Nine of ten passing for 135 and a TD in that one. That's excellent. Yeah. So I think we're at, and again, so I did just want to point out. I know we banged on, we pointed to the Southern game a lot. He's yeah. actually had backup because well, that's that's what really that's well. what fans do as well. It's like you go back to, and it's I don't even blame them. It's hard to get that out of your head when him just tossing the ball to Southern and giving them seven points. Like that that's hard to get out of your head. I, I do vaguely remember the New Mexico game where he came out and did it, but it didn't matter to people at that point, right? It didn't matter what he did, and it felt that way uh, going into really throughout the rest of the season. It didn't matter what he did because everybody was like, all right, he's gone. Get him out of here. Transfer. Leave. I just, again, I just wanted people to remember that this dude, like there's a reason. I wasn't just pulling it out of air being like, oh, this dude should start. And I Like, no, there's nothing. You watch him in fall camp. If you watched him – at times last year, you watch him spring spring ball. He can throw the ball, and there's something to work with there. That that was my only argument. So here is – okay, so now we're entering. We're recording this on Sunday. Um, the playoff games have been announced, but we, we don't know where LSU is going bowling yet. I would be surprised if it wasn't the Citrus Bowl in Orlando on January 2nd against a team like Purdue, whoever from uh, the Big Ten that's not in uh, yeah. the SC, or in the playoffs or in a New Year's Six Bowl. The I'm curious here, as we enter tomorrow, Monday is the transfer portal window opens. Prior to last night, I think most people thought, well, this all just hands on Daniels. If Daniels goes pro, or if the, you know, this is his final year at LSU, well, Nuss would stay, right? He would stay yeah. and try to be the starter. If Daniels returns for one more year, then Nuss entering year three would probably transfer and look for somewhere to start. That's like not a surprise when you talk quarterbacks. Yes. I don't know if last night changes anything. Uh, We don't even have to go down that rabbit hole because soon enough we'll know. And in the coming days or weeks, we will hear 
something definitive on that front. I'm very confident one way or the other. Um, and that's on Brian Kelly and the staff to figure out. I mean, obviously you're going to have to pick, you know, which way you want this to go quarterback wise for the future. They took Daniels in the off season, knowing that they would get through a year and potentially be in this spot. So the coaching staff can figure that out. We will yeah. talk about reactions once it happens. I'm curious of this. And I think this plays into everything that we're talking about here as well. Is the argument really, uh, I, or I think the, the argument for Nuss is that he pushes it downfield, that he's, it's a vertical passing game. You're taking yeah. advantage of the receivers uh, that Louisiana has, and we'll always give you. Is the argument really Nuss or Daniels, or is the argument that Brian Kelly and Den Brock and this 12 personnel idea, which essentially Georgia does, I mean, load up heavy, run play action, run the football, lean on two tight ends, have a great tight end. It, it works. I mean, you can get undefeated and through the SEC with that. But yeah. is the argument more about those two or is the argument that, oh, if you run this 12 personnel, you're not doing these things with the receivers when that approach is great at Notre Dame. It's great at Cincinnati. LSU is so different, even than Georgia, in a sense, that Louisiana churns out receivers at such a rate that if you choose that offense, you're kind of potentially not neglecting, but not really Limiting. leaning in to what your biggest strength on the roster is, which is typically receiver. I think that's a great point. I, that is that is the ultimate point here because that's how we have to look at this, I think, to a degree. Jaden Daniels came to LSU with the eyes of going pro at some point. Now, again, a week ago, last time we did a podcast, whenever it was, I said Jaden Daniels would come back and he'll be really, really good for this team, and uh, they'll be able to expand a little bit and grow from there. I think while Jaden Daniels is capable of improving and getting more comfortable, the pass game as a whole I don't think at all would be what Garrett Nussmeyer's passing game would be as an offense. And so with that being the case, I think it comes down to the coaches making a stylistic choice of how you want to play offense for the next, obviously next year, and then even moving moving past that. What do you want to instill in this offense? What do you want this offense to be under Mike Denbrock and Brian Kelly? And like you said, you know, this year they were um, 11. Well, they were 12 personnel really early in the season. And then they, you know, went to 11 with Mason Taylor, really rarely saw Cole Taylor and met Jack Mashburn and guys like that. So they adapted a little bit on that front. Will they continue to adapt or are they going to get in these tight ends, whether from the transfer portal or from the freshman class and be like, all right, now we can run the offense we want to run. Um, and Denbrock, Denbrock has had some vertical passing game with Desmond Ritter and Cincinnati before, but it kind of was within the flow of the offense. He didn't have a guy like Nussmeyer just going out there slinging it to guys, but he also didn't have the receivers that he has at LSU. It is a huge – it's one of the biggest questions, I think, of the offseason is how is this offense going to be molded moving forward? And I think it starts – with the quarterback position of Garrett Nussmeyer and Jaden Daniels, essentially who they choose to a degree. And because of, like you said, if Nussmeyer comes back, that means uh, if Daniels and Nussmeyer return, I think then they've both been told, you know, it's a competition at this point. And I think that's going to be really, really interesting going into the offseason to see how that plays out. I think just because of the modern era of the transfer portal and quarterback more than anyone being the first to, to try to leave that, it's tough to imagine a world where all, you know, both those guys come back, but I don't know. Again, we're it speculating. Is. We'll find out eventually and then we'll react to it. But I, I was just curious. I'm, I'm, and it sounds like you agree with me. And look, I'm not saying that a 12 personnel offense where you're meaning you're heavy on tight ends, you're running the ball a lot. You're, you're doing a lot of play action. You're not just out there vertical passing it all game, looking for explosive plays. I'm not saying that can't win here because that would be very stupid of me. Georgia just dropped 50 on LSU running 12 personnel. So, and they're undefeated. Yeah. The Todd Munkin offense is not far off from what Den Brock and Kelly do. I just think, which we talked about that LSU, especially when you're in Louisiana with these receivers puts you in such a unique situation that you really have to think how far do we want to lean into 12 personnel versus how far we want to, you know, how much, as we lean into 12 personnel, how much are we taking away from what we could do with that receiver room? That yeah. will be an off season question that uh, 
that I, that I think will be really interesting to follow. Yeah, and if we want to even just tie it back to the game a little bit, um, the running back room is going to be another interesting point of the offseason. And we'll have all offseason talk about all this, but, um, you know, <laughs> you end the year with John Emery, Noah Kane, Josh Williams as your running backs. As much as I like those guys, how many running back – and, you know, where, where does LSU's running back room rank in the SEC, in my opinion, right? Or even if you just look at the top-end guys – you go down the list of running backs. If you name the top 10 running backs in the SEC, LSU doesn't have one of those top 10, I don't think, off the top of my head. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how the run game starts to evolve and how if they can get a guy like a – I mean, Tank Bigsby, Devon A-Chain. I mean, you go down the list of running backs in the SEC. If they yeah, can get Gibbs, one of those guys – yeah. yeah, Gibbs. If they get a legitimate running back, how does that change their offense? So – a ton of questions uh, we have to look at. But last night, you take away Josh Williams' 47-yard run, they end the game with zero rushing yards. And obviously, that includes sacks, but still, the point remains. They couldn't run the ball on the, this Georgia team. And I think that's the offensive line being young, um, overwhelmed at times with a guy like Jalen Carter, the running backs uh, not quite being dynamic, and then um, Georgia just kind of imposing their will, and that kind of set the tone for the game whenever – LSU knew they couldn't run. They were going to have to throw the ball. Daniels, I thought, was good. Nussmeier was good. And uh, it just wasn't enough, though. I've never seen a um, a sack from a potential top three pick, Jalen Carter, Georgia. Yeah. Absolute beast. Where he picks up the quarterback with one arm and instead of the suplex or anything stupid, just waits for the whistle to blow it dead. And the whole time with his other hand – just holding up the number one. Just, I'm I'm right here. I'm holding your quarterback up in midair, um, and then that was the end of it. Then yeah, went went into oh. half. Look, Georgia, and I, this was the first point I made in my post game reactions, and I think it rings true without us having to dive incredibly deep into the game. Georgia is where LSU wants to be. Georgia, not just because they won the SEC, it's because they have a roster that's incredibly stable because they've recruited really well. They won a national championship a year ago. They get gutted, certainly defensively, by the NFL draft yeah. and take no transfers. All they do is just put the next guy up in 12 and 0, keep it churning. So I don't know what the gap between the two programs is, given LSU's coming from basically the bottom and building a foundation. Brian Kelly sounded like he didn't think the gap this day and age, I guess because of the portal and recruiting and all that, was incredibly like insurmountable that it would take years to get there. Um, yeah. Hell, he said his goal is not goal. He said the, the team will realize we're, our, we're coming right back here again next year. The goal will be to win it. We don't think we're that far off from Georgia, but the point remains, and Kelly said it, we aren't there, and that's okay. There is nothing wrong with that. We took over a program, with played a bowl game with 39 scholarship guys and a wide receiver at quarterback. Simultaneously, at that time, Georgia was winning a national championship. So, like, you're very far – but in one year, you made up a lot of ground. You won the SEC West. You got nine wins. You're going to go to a bowl to get a chance at 10 wins. So I don't know. It, I just do want to make the point that Georgia very much has the best kind of foundational structure right now in football, I feel like, for this season. Being able in the portal era to take no transfers and still roll out there and beat everybody and get to 13-0 and and get the number one seed in the playoffs and now they get an essential home game again in Atlanta uh, with a chance to win that and go to the national championship uh, in back-to-back -back seasons. So you want to be where Georgia is. They're not there yet, but Brian Kelly said it multiple times in the press conference. Uh, and I asked in the last question of the press conference, what does, I mean, he had gone five years before that A&M game without losing a game in November. Now that you lose the A&M game and you lose a conference title game, which Notre Dame was never playing in any conference title games, obviously, and you lose them, how does how does you make sure that does not take away from all the good stuff you accomplished? And Kelly said it doesn't. Look, they, they're they SEC West champs because of what they did on the field. They know how far we've come, but it's also okay to lose the game and turn around and do some self-reflection of this is where we need to continue to work. This is what we have to work on individually, collectively, whatever it might be. And he, I guess in a sense, he just said, look, we – we aren't down on ourselves. If anything, these two losses are just teaching moments of what we have to do to bring our A game and also what we have to do to build this roster to where we want it to be, to be competitive. So 
sort of some overarching thoughts there. Great season for LSU, way bit. Never thought we would be in Atlanta. Maddie B, you and I in the press box covering the SEC championship in the preseason. Certainly would have doubled down on that take after the Florida State loss when it was like, man, they just need to scratch and claw to get to a yeah. bowl. Six wins. Can they get to seven? That would be better than expectations. Yep. Um, and I said it all offseason. Last year was their first losing season since 1999. They won six games. When people asked me what Kelly needed to do in year one, I said win seven. Because that's improvement. You've improved. You won more games than you did a year ago. They won nine and went to an SEC championship. They won West. So the program is clearly on better footing than it was a year ago. Be happy yeah. with that. Be happy with the future. I don't know how much you want to dive into this game. Maddie B, if you had any major takeaways. Yeah, I'll, I got one. Um, well, actually, well, let's uh, to re- really recap offensively. It was good to see Kayshawn break off that big touchdown. No doubt. Um, good to see Malik, 128 yards, as always. And the uh, Kayshawn play was a Jaden play. That was a, yes. a great throw by Jaden, yep. and Kayshawn takes it the rest of the way. Yeah, which, again, yeah, we, we talked quarterbacks. I thought Daniels was actually really good in that first half on a bum ankle, nonetheless. The problem for me comes uh, defensively because, man, I, I, I know George is good, but – I don't think they should be dropping 50 on you. I no. really don't. I, nobody I just, should no, drop 50 on you. Yeah, nobody should be dropping 50 on you, uh, especially with how you played against uh, – I mean, again, Tennessee was like something, but Tennessee's offense is better than Georgia's. Um, obviously, as a team, they're not. But you start the game with a three and out, and I was actually like, okay, this looks good. This looks great, actually. You know, I started the game with three and out, and the defense looked physically ready, looked mentally ready, prepared for what uh, Georgia was doing in the run game. And I was like, okay, this is good. You go down 7-0 on the on the kick on the um blocked kick, which we'll talk about later, but I want to talk about defense for now. Get the sudden change on the interception, allow a touchdown. So that's not great. 14 points for Georgia, and that really wasn't completely on you. The following three drives go Georgia, nine plays, 58 yards, missed field goal. Georgia, 13 plays, 76 yards, touchdown. Georgia, f- five plays, 58 yards, touchdown. And I feel like that was where Georgia was able to pull away in the second quarter. And that's really where I was disappointed with this defense for not buckling down and stopping um, Georgia. And then from that point on, well, even from the first, uh, that first touchdown uh, with five, oh, oh, no, I don't know where the time is. Uh, was this 228 left in the second quarter? Um, it felt like LSU defense just faded and it went back to that A&M form where they were just getting pushed around, pushed around and, that was pretty disheartening to me to watch Georgia just pound it, pound them in the run game, but then also hit them over the top a good amount. Stetson Bennett, what did he finish? Uh, Stetson Bennett ends the game 23 of, of 29 for 274, four touchdowns, no picks. 80% and it, passer, 80% it felt, completion easy, percentage. It felt pretty easy for him for the most 80% part. 80% so, completion percentage. Yeah, that was pretty disappointing because I expected them to bounce back. I had this game 23 to 13, so I was way off, obviously. So did I. But I had this as a lower scoring game, and I thought LSU's defense would bounce back from the AM game, and they didn't. And that's pretty disappointing to me. How much of this are we being prisoners of the moment of the past two weeks and not just taking a step back and realizing the defense just is what they are? They patchworked a bunch of transfers at corner, they lost Mason Smith, their best player, on the first play of the first defensive drive of the year. They essentially leaned on Harold Perkins for half the season to to make all the plays for you at linebacker. Baskerville was a guy who we weren't even sure like was on the team in the spring. He's your core. Um, You know, Ali Gay didn't, you know, light the world on fire this year. BJ was going to be your best edge rusher. You needed Makai Wingo as a transfer to step up and essentially be your interior. Jaquel and Roy had a year. Um, But how much of it, yeah, we're – we're criticizing them because you don't like seeing Matt House's defense just get gashed. Yeah. A&M and Georgia just run. But how much of it is this is week game 12 and 13 with a team that has no real proven depth that yes. was already patching it together where you almost have to step back and say, I'm surprised that didn't happen every week. No, I, I agree. And I think you're, I think it's good that you we, we good cop, bad cop this. So, but yeah, you're definitely you're definitely right. The the proven depth part of this is the biggest because I 
I even mentioned on the podcast when Ali Gay was like, nobody's fresh at this point. And I mean, that's across the country. Nobody's fresh, obviously, right? You go Utah, USC, those guys are dead tired. Like everybody's tired right now. But the difference is there's some accumulated depth at Utah. There's some accumulated depth at Georgia. Um, I, I just that's the difference to me at Michigan. You know, there, there's some depth there that can help you through those tough times. And I just LSU doesn't have that at this moment. I think no. they saw that with AM. Even though the starters were getting blown off the ball, I don't want to blame this on like, you know, backup defensive tackles, of course. Not like, you know, I think BJ Ojolari struggled in the AM game. There were guys that struggled in the Georgia game uh that were starters, but as a team, as a whole, it's just not quite where the talent level needs to be as a defense to get to that level that they obviously will need to be at to, to compete with George on a consistent basis. So, yes, you are right, 100%. Uh, they have overachieved this year as a defense, and that's why for a lot of this year I was like, man, how good is this defense? Are they top three in the SEC? Um, I think it, just like the entire team, they overachieved. And then later in the season, we kind of see them come back to earth a little bit because the talent is, I think we were right going into the season, having them at eight wins. It's kind of the talent of an eight win team that had just played really, really sharp um, when it mattered most. And that's what Brian Kelly said, right? It's about making plays or it's about being your best when your best is called upon. And this team did that uh, for, for the most part. Yeah, it's that and the margin, and it all plays into what Kelly has said many times. Whether they won or lost, the margin for error with this roster was so thin that they needed to be kind of on point all the time. And when you're not, you see the result. And look, George is way better than LSU. So I'm not I'm not going home and screaming um, if I'm an LSU fan about the result of last night. It is what it is. I think most LSU fans probably just walk away curious about the quarterback competition, what it all means moving forward. I'll ask you this, and we've said this a number of times. Let's touch on special teams. Okay, good, good. That's what People I People were to get just to. screaming, fire Brian Poland, fire Brian Poland. Oh, he's got to be fired. And they've said this all year because the special teams is bad. Not everything that went wrong on special teams this year is Brian Poland's fault. Absolutely right. not. Like, he can't right. catch the football for some of these guys. I don't love the idea of, like, directional kickoffs where it's like, let's pin it in the corner and then it goes out of bounds and – even Georgia did it last night. Like, that's a coaching thing, but he can't get the kid to kick it, you know, yeah. in bounds. He kicks it out of bounds. Some of it is, and I think last night summed it up. Well. In, in fact, the first game of the season summed it up well, where they didn't block correctly on an extra point and got it blocked. Twice. Oh, please. twice. One yeah. on the extra point, yeah. One on the extra point. That was Florida State. In the final game now, that's all coaching. When you kick a field goal that gets blocked and nobody on the special teams unit realizes it's still a live ball. And I read George's uh, post-game interview after the kid who picked it up and ran it back 96 yards. He hesitated when the ball was still rolling. He said, I was just looking over at our sidelines because we're coached to, we're going to yes, go or don't leave it be. So he sat there almost like, I want to pick this up because I know the rule. I'm going to pick it up and run it. Do you want me to? And then he sees everybody waving him, so he picks it up and runs it. Kirby said, we practice that a lot in practices. LSU had very clearly never addressed that. And if they did, somehow all 11 guys that are on that unit didn't think about it. Like, Kelly said it after the game. He said, that's on me. He didn't name anybody. But he said, we have to coach that. And it was very clear that that moment wasn't coached. LSU would have gone up. It, well, it got blocked. But if you make that, you go up 3 nothing. And it's the end of the first quarter. You don't make it. They return it for a touchdown on a play you didn't even like. If it got blocked, they scooped it. All of LSU's running after the guy. They yeah. make some blocks. And it's just, man, what bad luck. LSU just didn't know the rules. That is the by far the biggest special teams coaching moment of the year for me. Like yeah. It was very clear that all 11 guys who were on special teams had no clue that was still a live ball. I mean, how the kick even gets blocked. I, I I remember when I went back and watched the highlights, I was like, I forgot it was that close of a kick. Like, what was it, a 30-yard field goal? Like, it was a ridiculously close kick to where, and I know the snap was a little high, so he brought it down, but, like, A, the kick should have never been that low, but B, um, again, why are we having to worry about blocked, basically blocked extra points and field goals 
at this point in time in the year. That's the first thing. The second thing is, and we talked about this as well, is he could have picked that ball up like five seconds earlier. LSU was already look, walking off the field like as soon as it got blocked. Like, And that goes to your point of they had no idea, zero idea that the ball was live and that it was a threat to be scored. Zero idea. And for him to be standing over the ball for five seconds, being like, can I go? Should I go? And LSU just w- on the sideline, damn it. They had already walked off the field. Like, and then he finally picks it up and goes. And you're just like, it, it, it really was. And while I understand what Brian Kelly said, it's like, you know, well, if that play doesn't happen, we're closer here and there. Well, you know what? You should be penalized seven points for not knowing the damn rules on special teams. At the end of the day, that's going to cost you at some point in the year. It, so, yeah, it's bad luck. Sure, I guess it's bad luck, but you didn't know the rules. So it's I, seven points for Georgia, and that's how that should go. We were sitting in the press box. I'm sitting next to you on the left, the legendary Scooter Hobbs, out of like Charles on the right, and they're returning it, and Scooter says, what are they doing? And I looked at Scooter, and I said, it's a live ball. And Scooter says, I know it's a live ball. I'm asking you why <laughs> they don't know it's a live ball. <laughs> that, like, it's, that, that was unbelievable to me, that you can be in an SEC championship, the highest level of college football, and not know a fundamental rule of special teams. Yeah. That blew my mind. So let me ask you this. We've said this a million times, like when people get, people love to hate any coach when something doesn't go right. So let's just say offensive coordinator. Well, they need to move on from Denbrock. You don't want to, and they won't, because you don't want to bring in a whole nother coordinator and change a whole nother system and do that. That just puts you behind the eight ball again. What you want to do is what we talked about at the start of the pod, decide how you're going to continue to shift and adjust the offensive philosophy much like they did from going 12 personnel to 11 personnel as the season went on. That's fine and dandy. My I'm reading everyone fire Brian Pullen, fire Brian Pullen. Look, I know he's the recruiting coordinator. He played a massive role in kind of heading up the transfer portal a year ago. I don't care about any of that in the sense of who coaches the actual unit. Like all that's great. Like, and that's fine. Everyone has a responsibility. That's not their unit uh, to a degree. I just want to judge this purely on special teams. I don't really care what everybody else does with their job. If the special teams unit's not coached up enough, I don't really care if who's court. And this is not at Brian Pauline at all. I wouldn't care who was the coach. I don't care if what you're in charge of that's not special teams, if your actual main role is not good. Now, I don't know how much of it you can put on him, coaching, the actual players. I don't yeah. know. My thing is this. Brian Kelly has coached with – Brian Polian for longer than any other coach on the staff. Brian Kelly has coached for 30 something years and had a lot of success. He clearly thinks Brian Polian is good enough to get this job done. That's why I would think he wouldn't even have brought him down here. Right. If he didn't think that's my guy for special teams. Now, at the same time, you can call him sour or whatever. Notre Dame fans screamed that their special teams were always – something was always up with them. This year they had excellent special teams. So I don't know. I don't fire coaches. I don't hire coaches. I don't even know what happens in the film room where you break it down and you understand responsibilities. I don't understand if he's teaching it and the guys just aren't getting it. I don't know what it is, right? But I'm curious to hear your thoughts of People make it seem so simple. Like, oh, just fire him. Like, and if Brian Kelly doesn't do that, that says a lot about Brian Kelly. Does it say a lot? Well, why weren't you saying that when he brought him down here? He knows exactly what he's getting. And if that's the product, you would have thought he would have fired him a long time ago. So, I don't know. I'm at an odd crossroads where it's like, how much of it is on the coordinator? That moment's on the coordinator. And how much of the bad stuff's on the coordinator? How great of a coach he is? All this stuff. That's on Brian Kelly to decide, but I do feel like there is a faction of this fan base that will look at that, and if he's still the special teams coordinator next year, we'll say, man, I don't know. Well, I don't know. I mean, hell, they should be skeptical at this point, point. and it's it's like Brian Kelly obviously shouldn't give a damn what anybody says at this point. If he trusts Brian Brian Polian – He's and I don't one. think Kelly does give a damn about anything outside. I think if you've been a coach for 30 something years yeah. and at this level and you've gotten that much success, I'm with you. You trust your gut and what you know and what you see. You don't care about anything else. And I, I can promise you, and this is another thing. It's like 
I can promise you Brian Kelly is as frustrated with special teams as all probably the fans more frustrated. Are. Probably definitely more, more frustrated. Say. Uh, definitely more frustrated. And I would so, think Brian Polian is as frustrated as anyone yes. is. So, you yes. know, I'm not trying to – I am not trying to pick on Brian Polian here. No. But he's a coach who makes money. Like, it's different yeah. than when we say something about a player and it's like, well, you know, they're yeah. college kids. It's different. Polian's been a head coach before. He's yes. been around the block. He's not going to think that anything about this year's special team performances were good. I just was curious if you think that that's something that has to be addressed in the offseason yeah. or um, – it's going to be interesting because I you can bring in – like there are different analysts and people that you can bring in that aren't going to make headlines that can help you significantly in those regards. Uh, but the staggering part is like you said, Brian Pullian has been a head coach at Nevada, which is a good job. Like this is – it's not it's not like he was a head coach at freaking a FCS school, a small FCS school or anything like that. Like this is a guy who's been around the block. So I, I do think there's a balance here. To where players, it's coaches. Uh, obviously, last night was really unacceptable, and I think Brian Kelly, when assessing this team, is going to assess the special teams position, uh, uh, coach rather. And I just don't think there will be many, if any, coaching changes, barring them getting hired away for an upgraded job. But uh, I just can't see many changes. Again, Denbrock not going anywhere house no. not going anywhere unless he gets hired as a head coach somewhere once i don't know what his aspirations are but you know something like that brad david like you know guys i just don't see the 10 on field coaches changing very much at all and so you could say that that's a bad thing i guess but i think it's a pretty good thing because you need continuity in this program from top to bottom from players to coaches at administration analyst everything you need con consistency and I think that's what Brian Kelly's going to try to have this offseason. I'll wrap up on this thought too, because it's like special teams is one of those things. And I'm not like Brian Pauline said it before the year. He said, y'all were spoiled with, you know, Cole Tracy and Cade York um, to it, which is to a degree is right. Like you don't, you're not just going to roll out every year an NFL kicker in Cade York who can just kick you 57 yard field goals. Hell, Ramos game. has been really, really good this year. I, I mean, Ramos is a walk on watch. that Greg McMahon brought in and he's, yeah, and he's been solid for when you've needed him to, to do it about what I expected. If not, maybe a little bit better than I expected. He's not going to yeah. kick it from 50 yards, but it was about what I expected. Here's my thing. I've been around this program 20 years. Thomas McGahey, who's been in the NFL a long time is one of the best special teams coaches I've ever seen. The same I would put into that same category, a guy like Greg McMahon, who Ed O hired and was here the past and went and found all these kickers and um, recruited well at you know a number of different spots. Excellent mind had been in the NFL forever. Both those guys, none of these kind of things that we were talking about ever happened. You, they, there were never times where people blocked wrong on extra points. There were never times where. You just couldn't find a returner because everyone was fumbling it and didn't know, you know, to catch it or not catch, you know, whatever it might be, or that they didn't know the rule of getting a field goal blocked and it's still being live, that it's not like an extra point that where it just immediately is blown dead. I have seen excellent special teams coaches here. None of that stuff ever happened. Special teams should be an area that in, in beyond like you've got like some amazing kicker like Cade York and you're kicking 57 yard field goals for the wind and the fog at the swamp yeah. or things like that. Or you've got an electric return man who's like going out and scoring a few touchdowns for you or can really swing field position a couple of times. Tyron Matthew style beyond those things, special teams should be an area you never talk about. Like you shouldn't even notice it. We talked about it every game this year. That I, I it, in my mind, that's what I can't get past. Special teams, the for me, long snapper sums up what special teams is about. If you never hear the long snapper's name mentioned all year, he did an excellent job. If we don't have to talk about special teams, they did their job. Yeah, we talked about special teams every single week. Yep, yep, and uh, yeah, that that was a obviously just a staggering moment there so um and it did it kind of set the it changed the trajectory of the game whether i thought they i don't think they would have beat georgia if it didn't happen 
But damn, it would have been a better game than what we got if that didn't happen. So that that's disappointing uh, on that front. But yeah, I think we covered everything else though. Uh, Shay, I think we got. Yeah, this uh, was one of our longest podcasts. I figured with that blowout, it'd be one of our shorter ones. Hey, get get people home. You know, maybe they got a. Go. Uh, they're probably already on their flights that they're flying. But hey, you know, get people uh, on the way back. But um, we will find out here soon what the bowl game is. If everyone that I've talked to still says it will looking very, very much like the Citrus Bowl, which would be January 2nd in Orlando, which, if anything, you get a little walkthrough before you have to go back to that same spot to play Florida State in the opener next year, but against someone like a Purdue who obviously lost to Michigan last night in the Big Ten Championship game. But we'll find that out for sure. That is not take it to the bank yet. But barring them going to the Vegas Bowl, which I don't think they will, and that would be crushing for recruiting because of the date, it's – on December 17th. Mm -hmm. Our guess is we're probably four weeks away, right, Matty B? We've got a month without football here would be the guess. Yeah. Uh, Brett McMurphy just started tweeting out some uh, some of the uh, some of the uh, ones. Well, we already know all the P6 ones, but like Southern Miss and Rice are playing in the Lending Tree Bowl, for those wondering. Breaking as of a minute ago. Well, there's some Hattiesburg folks listening in, and they're going to be happy to hear that Southern is bowling. There you go. Um but LSU fans probably still don't like hearing Southern after the the baseball, the baseball uh, series last year. Oh. So don't want to hear about Southern Miss. But all right, that's all we got. We hope you all enjoyed it. We we jumped around. We covered everything: quarterback, the game, special teams, everything. And we will have a mailbag tomorrow. Um, tomorrow, how many, too, mail, how many of the mailbag pod, uh, questions are just going to be quarterback or special teams related? All of them are going to be quarterback and special teams. Well, here's the here's the rally. We'll have the mailbag pod uh, for you on Monday. Um, but Monday also opens up the transfer portal. Yes. You've seen a lot of kids talking about entering the portal. Unless they have graduated college already, they cannot actually enter until Monday. We have not seen a single, at the time of this podcast, LSU kid enter. We do expect a number of them to enter, but way more so natural attrition. And what we mean yeah. by that is this is what the portal is for. I'm not playing. I'm not sure how much playing time I'll get next year. I'd like to go somewhere else and, and try to get on the field. That's expected. So we will have plenty of transfer talk. You've got the hat on. Bengal Tiger is still a year for a dollar. That's not going to last much longer. And you get the free hat. So if you've been listening to the podcast or YouTube or you just stumbled on us, uh, we do have the website where we spend all of our time on On3 yeah. and the Bengal Tiger. And uh, we're growing rapidly there. So shout out to all them. Shout out to everyone who wore their Bengal Tiger hats. Um, some people have been wearing the PMAC, they said, been yes. wearing them to the games. Uh, Send us pictures. We Well, we need the picture of um, the legendary Sweet Larry, who Marietta, George, Georgia native, evidently made the big screen at the game in his Bengal Tiger hat in his backyard in Georgia. Um, if anybody, uh, I don't know if it actually made the TV broadcast. If so, I'll catch it on the second go around. But yeah, uh, if anyone's got pictures, share them with us. That is funny. My head That's was funny. on a swivel. I was walking around with Matthew in Atlanta saying, I'm just looking for Bengal Tiger hats. So <laughs> send us the pictures, send us pictures, whatever you got uh, at, at games or the football games, basketball games, whatever y'all got. Um, but yeah, that's that's it. That'll do it for the podcast. Uh, like Shay said, if it's the Citrus Bowl, it'll be January second, so we got a month where we can really lock in on recruiting. Signing day, twenty first. It's gonna heat up real quickly, and we will have the recruiting podcast later this week as well. But mailbag out on Monday uh, again. Those are for, that's for subscribers only. Well, I'll, I will post on the board uh, Sunday night whenever I remember to post them. And yeah, that'll be it. You got anything else? That's it for me. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Leave us a like, comment, share, and subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, subscribe to the Bengal Tiger. Uh, $1 for a year, like Shay said. Not going to last too much longer, especially with the way that you know the site has been growing. We're really appreciative of all the support on there. Uh, leave us a five-star rating and review wherever you're listening, on Spotify, Apple, all that stuff. Appreciate you all as well, and we will talk to you all later.